This audio production was made in collaboration with Audible Anarchist. Mutual Aid, A Factor Revolution by Peter Kropotkin Chapter 6 Mutual Aid in the Medieval City Continued The medieval cities were not organized upon some preconceived plan in obedience to the will of an outside legislator. Each of them was a natural growth in the full sense of the word, an always varying result of struggle between various forces which adjusted and readjusted themselves in conformity with their relative energies. The chances of their conflicts and the support they found in their surroundings Therefore, there are not two cities whose inner organization and destinies would have been identical. Each one, taken separately, varies from century to century. And yet, when we cast a broad glance upon all the cities of Europe, the local and national unlikenesses disappear, and we are struck to find among all of them a wonderful resemblance. Although each has developed for itself, independently from the others, and in different conditions. A small town in the north of Scotland, with its population of coarse labourers and fishermen, a rich city of Flanders, with its worldwide commerce, luxury, love of amusements and animated life, an Italian city enriched by its intercourse with the East, and breeding within its walls a refined artistic taste and civilization, and a poor, chiefly agricultural city in the marsh and lakes district of Russia seem to have little in common. And nevertheless, the leading lines of their organization and the spirit which animates them are imbued with a strong family likeness. Everywhere we see the same federations of small communities and guilds, the same sub-towns around the mother city, the same folk moat and the same ensigns of its independence. The defensor of the city, under different names and in different Coutremans represents the same authority and interests. Food supplies, labor and commerce are organized on closely similar lines. Inner and outer struggles are fought with like ambitions. Nay, the very formulae used in the struggles, as also in the annals, the ordinances and the rolls, are identical. And the architectural monuments, whether Gothic, Roman, or Byzantine in style, express the same aspirations and the same ideals. They are conceived and built in the same way. Many dissemblances are mere differences of age, and those disparities between sister cities, which are real, are repeated in different parts of Europe. The unity of the leading idea and the identity of origin make up for differences of climate, geographical situation, wealth, language, and religion. This is why we can speak of the medieval city as of a well-defined face of civilization. And while every research insisting upon local and individual differences is most welcome, we may still indicate the chief lines of development which are common to all cities. There is no doubt that the protection which used to be accorded to the marketplace from the earliest barbarian times has played an important, though not an exclusive, part in the emancipation of the medieval city. The early barbarians knew no trade within their village communities. They traded with strangers only, at certain definite spots on certain determined days. And in order that the stranger might come to the barter place without risk of being slain for some feud which might be running between two kins, the market was always placed under the special protection of all kins. It was inviolable, like the place of worship under the shadow of which it was held. With the cabals it is still the anaya, like the footpath along which women carry water from the well. Neither must be trodden upon in arms even during inter-tribal wars. In medieval times, the market universally enjoyed the same protection. No feud could be prosecuted on the place where two people came to trade, nor within a certain radius from it. And if a quarrel arose in the motley crowd of buyers and sellers, it had to be brought before those under whose protection the market stood, the community's tribunal, or the bishops, the lords, or the king's judge. A stranger who came to trade was a guest, and he went on under this very name. 
Even the lord who had no scruples about robbing a merchant on the high road respected the Welschild, that is, the pole which stood in the marketplace and bore either the king's arms or a glove or the image of the local saint or simply a cross, according to whether the market was under the protection of the king, the lord, the local church, or the folkmoor, the vieje. It is easy to understand how the self-jurisdiction of the city could develop out of the special jurisdiction in the marketplace when this last right was conceded, willingly or not, to the city itself. And such an origin of the city's liberties, which can be traced in very many cases, necessarily laid a special stamp upon their subsequent development. It gave a predominance to the trading part of the community. The burghers who possessed a house in the city at the time being, and were co-owners in the town lands, constituted very often a merchant guild, which held in its hands the city's trade. And although at the outset every burgher, rich and poor, could make part of the merchant guild, and the trade itself seems to have been carried on for the entire city by its trustees, the guild gradually became a sort of privileged body. It jealously prevented the outsiders who soon began to flock into the free cities from entering the guild, and kept the advantages resulting from trade for the few families which had been burghers at the time of the emancipation. There evidently was a danger of a merchant oligarchy being thus constituted. But already in the 10th, and still more during the two next centuries, the chief crafts, also organized in guilds, were powerful enough to check the oligarchic tendencies of the merchants. The craft guild was then a common seller of its produce, and a common buyer of the raw materials. And its members were merchants and manual workers at the same time. Therefore, the predominance taken by the old craft guilds from the very beginning of the free city life guaranteed to manual labor the high position which it afterwards occupied in the city. In fact, in a medieval city, manual labor was no token of inferiority. It bore, on the contrary, traces of the high respect it had been kept in in the village community. Manual labor in a mystery was considered as a pious duty towards the citizens, a public function, amt, as honorable as any other, an idea of justice to the community, of a right towards both producer and consumer, which would seem so extravagant now, penetrated production and exchange. The tanners, the coopers, or the shoemakers' work must be just, fair, they wrote in those times. Wood, leather, or thread, which are used by the artisan, must be right. Bread must be baked in justice, and so on. Transport this language into our present life, and it would seem affected and unnatural. But it was natural and unaffected then, because the medieval artisan did not produce for an unknown buyer, or to throw his goods into an unknown market. He produced for his guild first, for a brotherhood of men who knew each other, knew the tendencies of the craft, and in naming the price of each product could appreciate the skill displayed in its fabrication or the labor bestowed upon it. Then the guild, not the separate producer, offered the goods for sale in the community, and this last, in its turn, offered to the brotherhood of allied communities those goods which were exported and assumed responsibility for their quality. With such an organization was the ambition of each craft not to offer goods of inferior quality, and technical defects or adulterations became a matter concerning the whole community, because an ordinance says they would destroy public confidence. Production being thus a social duty placed under the control of the whole amitas, manual labor could not fall into the degraded condition which it occupies now, so long as a free city was living. A difference between master and apprentice, or between master and worker, compine, gesell, existed, but in the medieval cities, from their very beginning, this was at the outset a mere difference of age and skill, not of wealth and power. After a seven years apprenticeship, and after having proved his knowledge and capacities by a work of art, the apprentice became a master himself, and only much later, in the 16th century, after the royal power had destroyed the city and the craft organization, was it possible to become master in virtue of simple inheritance or wealth? 
but this was also the time of a general decay in medieval industries and art. There was not much room for hired work in the early flourishing periods of the medieval cities, still less for individual hirelings. The work of the weavers, the archers, the smiths, the bakers and so on was performed for the craft and the city, and when craftsmen were hired in the building trades, they worked as temporary corporations, as they still do in the Russian artels, whose work was paid en bloc. Work for a master began to multiply only later on. But even in this case, the worker was paid better than he is now. Even in this country, and very much better than he used to be paid all over Europe in the first half of this century. Thorold Rogers has familiarized English readers with this idea, but the same is true for the continent as well, as is shown by the researches of Falke and Schoenberg, and by many occasional indications. Even in the 15th century, a mason, a carpenter, or a smith worker would be paid at Amiens four sols a day, which corresponded to 48 pounds of bread, or to the eighth part of a small ox, bouval. In Saxony, the salary of the Giselle in the building trade was such that, to put it in Falke's words, he could buy with his six days' wages three sheep and one pair of shoes. The donations of workers, Giselle, to cathedrals also bear testimony of their relative well-being, to say nothing of the glorious donations of certain craft guilds, nor of what they used to spend in festivities and pageants. In fact, the more we learn about the medieval city, the more we are convinced that at no time has labor enjoyed such conditions of prosperity and such respect as when city life stood at its highest. More than that, not only many aspirations of our modern radicals were already realized in the Middle Ages, but much of what is described now as utopian was accepted then as a matter of fact. We are laughed at when we say that work must be pleasant, but everyone must be pleased with his work, a medieval Kuttenberg ordinance says, and no one shall while doing nothing mit nicht tun, appropriate for himself what others have produced by application and work because laws must be a shield for application and work. And amidst all present talk about an eight-hour workday, it may be well to remember an ordinance of Ferdinand I relative to the imperial coal mines, which settled the miner's day at eight hours, as it used to be of old. Wie vor altes herkommen. And work on Saturday afternoon was prohibited. Longer hours were very rare, we are told by Jansen, while shorter hours were of common occurrence. In this country, in the 15th century, Roger says, the workmen worked only 48 hours a week. The Saturday half-holiday, too, which we consider as a modern conquest, was in reality an old medieval institution. It was bathing time for a great part of the community, while Wednesday afternoon was bathing time for the gazelle. And although school meals did not exist, probably because no children went hungry to school, a distribution of bath money to the children whose parents found difficulty in providing it was habitual in several places. As the labor congresses, they also were a regular feature of the Middle Ages. In some parts of Germany, craftsmen of the same trade, belonging to different communes, used to come together every year to discuss questions relative to their trade the years of apprenticeship, the wandering years, the wages, and so on. And in 1572, the Hanseatic towns formally recognized the right of the crafts to come together at periodical congresses and to take any resolutions, so long as they were not contrary to the city's roles relative to the quality of goods. Such labor congresses, partly international, like the Hansa itself, are known to have been held by bakers, founders, smiths, tanners, sword makers, and cask makers. The craft organization required, of course, a close supervision of the craftsmen by the guild, and special jurates were always nominated for that purpose. But it is most remarkable that so long as the cities lived their free life, no complaints were heard about the supervision, while after the state stepped in, confiscating the property of the guilds and destroying their independence in favor of its own bureaucracy, the complaints became simply countless. 
On the other hand, the immensity of progress realized in all arts under the medieval guild system is the best proof that the system was no hindrance to individual initiative. The fact is that the medieval guild, like the medieval parish, street or quarter, was not a body of citizens placed under the control of state functionaries. It was a union of all men connected with a given trade, durate buyers of raw produce, sellers of manufactured goods and artisans, masters, companions and apprentices. For the inner organization of the trade, its assembly was sovereign, so long as it did not hamper the other guilds, in which case the matter was brought before the guild of the guilds, the city. But there was in it something more than that. It had its own self-jurisdiction, its own military force, its own general assemblies, its own traditions of struggles, glory and independence, its own relations with other guilds of the same trade in other cities. It had, in a word, a full organic life which could only result from the integrality of the vital functions. When the town was called to arms, the guild appeared as a separate company, Shah, armed with its own arms or its own guns, lovingly decorated by the guild at a subsequent epoch, under its own self-elected commanders. It was, in a word, as independent a unit of the Federation as the Republic of Uri or Geneva was 50 years ago in the Swiss Confederation. So that, to compare it with a modern trade union, divested of all attributes of state sovereignty and reduced to a couple of functions of secondary importance, is as unreasonable as to compare Florence or Brigue with a French commune vegetating under the Code Napoleon, or the Russian town placed under Catherine II's municipal law. Both have elected mayors, and the latter has also its craft corporations. But the difference is, all the difference that exists between Florence and Fontenelle-Les, or Tsarevokoskaisk, or between Venetian Doge and a modern mayor who lifts his hat before the sous-préfet clerk. The medieval guilds were capable of maintaining their independence, and later on, especially in the 14th century, when in consequence of several causes which shall presently be indicated, the old municipal life underwent a deep modification. The younger crafts proved strong enough to conquer the due share in the management of the city affairs. The masses organized in minor arts rose to wrest the power out of the hands of a growing oligarchy and mostly succeeded in this task, opening again a new era of prosperity. True that in some cities the uprising was crushed in blood and mass decapitations of workers followed, as was the case in Paris in 1306 and in Cologne in 1371. In such cases, the city's liberties rapidly fell into decay, and the city was gradually subdued by the central authority. But the majority of the towns had preserved enough of vitality to come out of the turmoil with a new life and vigor. A new period of rejuvenance was their reward. New life was infused, and it found its expression in splendid architectural monuments, in a new period of prosperity, in a sudden progress of techniques and invention and in a new intellectual movement leading to the Renaissance and to the Reformation. The life of a medieval city was a succession of hard battles to conquer liberty and to maintain it. True that a strong and tenacious race of burghers had developed during those fierce contests. True that love and worship of the mother city had been bred by these struggles, and that the grand things achieved by the medieval commune were a direct outcome of that love. But the sacrifices which the commune had to sustain in the battle for freedom were, nevertheless, cruel and left deep traces of division on their inner life as well. Very few cities had succeeded under a concurrence of favorable circumstances in obtaining liberty at one stroke, and these few mostly lost it equally easily. While the great number had to fight fifty or a hundred years in succession, often more, before their rights to free life had been recognized, and another hundred years to found their liberty on a firm basis. The twelfth century charters thus being but one of the stepping stones to freedom. In reality, the medieval city was a fortified oasis amidst the country plunged into feudal submission, and it had to make room for itself by the force of its arms. 
in consequence of the courses briefly alluded to in the preceding chapter, each village community had gradually fallen under the yoke of some lay or clerical lord. His house had grown to be a castle, and his brothers-in-arms were now the scum of adventurers, always ready to plunder the peasants. In addition to three days a week, which the peasants had to work for the lord, they had also to bear all sorts of exactions for the right to sow and to crop, to be gay or sad, to live, to marry, or to die. And worst of all, they were continually plundered by the armed robbers of some neighboring lord, who chose to consider them as their master's kin, and to take upon them and upon their cattle and crops the revenge for a feud he was fighting against their owner. Every meadow, every field, every river and road around the city, and every man upon the land was under some lord. The hatred of the burghers towards the feudal barons has found a most characteristic expression in the wording of the different charters which they compelled them to sign. Heinrich V is made to sign in the charter granted to Speyer in 1111 that he frees the burghers from the horrible and ex execrable law of Mortman, through which the town has been sunk into deepest poverty. Von dem scheußlichen und nichtwürdigen Gesetze, welches gemein Budel genannt wird. Kelsen, 1307. The Kutum, or Bayonne, written about 1273, contains such passages as these. The people is anterior to the lords. It is the people, more numerous than all others, who, desirous of peace, has made the lords for bridling and knocking down the powerful ones, and so on. Giri, at the de Rouen, 117, quoted by Lucher, 24. A charter submitted for King Robert's signature is equally characteristic. He is made to say in it, I shall rob no oxen nor other animals. I shall seize no merchants nor take their monies, nor impose ransom. From Lady Day to the All Saints' Day, I shall seize no horse nor mare nor foals in the meadows. I shall not burn the mills nor rob the flower. I shall offer no protection to thieves, etc. Pfister has published that document, reproduced by Lecher. The charter granted by the Besançon Archbishop Hughes in which he has been compelled to enumerate all the mischiefs due to his mortman rights, is equally characteristic, and so on. Freedom could not be maintained in such surroundings, and the cities were compelled to carry on the war outside their walls. The burghers sent out emissaries to lead revolt in the villages. They received villages into their corporations, and they waged direct war against the nobles. In Italy, where the land was thickly sprinkled with feudal castles, the war assumed heroic proportions and was fought with a stern acrimony on both sides. Florence sustained for 77 years a succession of bloody wars in order to free its contado from the nobles. But when the conquest had been accomplished in 1181, all had to begin anew. The nobles rallied, they constituted their own leagues in opposition to the leagues of the towns, and receiving fresh support from either the emperor or the pope, they made the war last for another 130 years. The same took place in Rome, in Lombardy, all over Italy. Prodigies of valor, audacity, and tenaciousness were displayed by the citizens in these wars. But the bows and the hatchets of the arts and crafts had not always the upper hand in their encounters with the armor-clad knights, and many castles withstood the ingenious siege machinery and the preservance of the citizens. Some cities like Florence, Bologna, and many towns in France, Germany, and Bohemia succeeded in emancipating the surrounding villages, and they were rewarded for their efforts by an extraordinary prosperity and tranquility. But even here, and still more in the less strong or less impulsive towns, the merchants and artisans, exhausted by war and misunderstanding their own interests, bargained over the peasants' heads. They compelled the lord to swear allegiance to the city. His country castle was dismantled, and he agreed to build a house and to reside in the city, of which he became a co-burger, con bourgeois, con cittadino. But he maintained in return most of his rights upon the peasants, who only won a partial relief from their burdens. 
The burgher could not understand that equal rights of citizenship might be granted to the peasant upon whose food supplies he had to rely, and a deep rent was traced between town and village. In some cases the peasant simply changed owners, the city buying out the baron's rights and selling them in shares to their own citizens. Serfdom was maintained and only much later on, towards the end of the 13th century, it was the craft revolution which undertook to put an end to it and abolished personal servitude, but dispossessed at the same time the serfs of the land. It hardly need be added that the fatal results of such policy were soon felt by the cities themselves. The country became the city's enemy. The war against the castles had another bad effect. It involved the cities in a long succession of mutual wars, which have given origin to the theory, till lately in vogue, Namely, that the towns lost their independence through their own jealousies and mutual fights. The imperialist historians have especially supported this theory, which, however, is very much undermined now by modern research. It is certain that in Italy cities fought each other with a stubborn animosity, but nowhere else did such contests attain the same proportions. And in Italy itself the city wars, especially those of the earlier period, had their special causes. They were, as was already shown by Sismondi and Ferrari, a mere continuation of the war against the castles. The free municipal and federative principle unavoidably entering into a fierce contest with feudalism, imperialism and papacy. Many towns which had to partially shaken off the yoke of the bishop, the lord or the emperor, were simply driven against the free cities by the nobles, the emperor and church, whose policy was to divide the cities and to arm them against each other. These special circumstances, partly reflected on to Germany also, explain why the Italian towns, some of which sought support with the emperor to combat the pope, while the others sought support from the church to resist the emperor, were soon divided into a Ghibelline and a Guelf camp, and why the same division appeared in each separate city. The immense economical progress realized by most Italian cities just at the time when these wars were hottest, and the alliances so easily concluded between towns, still better characterized those struggles and further undermined the above theory. Already in the years 1130 to 1150, powerful leagues came into existence, and a few years later, when Frederick Barbossa invaded Italy and, supported by the nobles and some Ritadori cities, marched against Milan, Popular enthusiasm was roused in many towns by popular preachers. Crema, Piacenza, Brescia, Tortona, etc. went to the rescue. The banners of the guilds of Verona, Padua, Vicenza and Trevisa floated side by side in the city's camp against the banners of the emperor and the nobles. Next year the Lombardian League came into existence and 60 years later we see it reinforced by many other cities and forming a lasting organization which had a half of its federal war chest in Genoa and the other half in Venice. In Tuscany, Florence had another powerful league to which Lucca, Bologna, Pistoia, etc. belonged, and which played an important part in crushing down the nobles in Middle Italy, while smaller leagues were of common occurrence. It is thus certain that although petty jealousies undoubtedly existed, and discord could be easily sown, they did not prevent the towns from uniting together for the common defense of liberty. Only later on, when separate cities became little states, wars broke out between them, as always must be the case when states struggle for supremacy or colonies. Similar leagues were formed in Germany for the same purpose. When under the successors of Conrad, the land was the prey of interminable feuds between the nobles, the Westphalian towns concluded a league against the knights, one of the clauses of which was never to lend money to a knight who would continue to conceal stolen goods. When the knights and the nobles lived on plunder and murder whom they chose to murder, as the Wormsaison complains, the cities of the Rhine, Mainz, Cologne, Speyer, Strasbourg and Basel, took the initiative of a league which soon numbered 60 allied towns, repressed the robbers and maintained peace. Later on, the League of the Towns of Swabia divided into three peace districts, Augsburg, Constance and Ulm, had the same purpose. 
And even when such leagues were broken, they lived long enough to show that while the supposed peacemakers, the kings, the emperors, and the church fomented discord, and were themselves helpless against the robber knights, it was from the cities that the impulse came for re-establishing peace and union. The cities, not the emperors, were the real makers of the national unity. Similar federations were organized for the same purpose among small villages, and now that attention has been drawn to this subject by Lucher, we may expect soon to learn much more about them. Villages joined into small confederations in the Contado of Florence, so also in the dependencies of Novgorod and Peskov. As to France, there is positive evidence of a federation of 17 peasant villages, which has existed in the Launaise for nearly a hundred years, till 1256, and has fought hard for its independence. Three more peasant republics, which had sworn charters similar to those of Laon and Soissons, existed in the neighborhood of Laon, and their territories being contiguous, they supported each other in their liberation wars. Altogether, Lucher is of the opinion that many such federations must have come into existence in France in the 12th and 13th centuries, but that documents relative to them are mostly lost. Of course, being unprotected by walls, they could easily be crushed down by the kings and the lords. But in certain favorable circumstances, when they found support in a league of towns and protection in their mountains, such peasant republics became independent units of Swiss confederation. As to unions between cities for peaceful purposes, they were of quite common occurrence. The intercourse which had been established during the period of liberation was not interrupted afterwards. Sometimes, when the scabini of a German town, having to pronounce judgment in a new or complicated case, declared that they knew not the sentence, des urheiles nicht weiser zu sein, they sent delegates to another city to get the sentence. The same happened also in France, while Forli and Ravenna, are known to have mutually naturalized their citizens and granted them full rights in both cities. To submit a contest arisen between two towns or within a city to another commune which was invited to act as arbiter was also in the spirit of the times. As to commercial treaties between cities, they were quite habitual. Unions for regulating the production and the sizes of casks, which were used for the commerce in wine, herring unions and so on, were mere precursors of the great commercial federations of the Flemish Hansa, and later on of the great North German Hansa, the history of which alone might contribute pages and pages of, to illustrate the federation spirit which permeated men at that time. It hardly need be added, and through the Hanseatic unions the medieval cities have contributed more to the development of international intercourse, navigation, and maritime discovery than all the states of the first 17 centuries of our era. In a word, federations between small territorial units, as well as among men, united by common pursuits within their respective guilds and federations between cities and groups of cities, constituted the very essence of life and thought during that period. The first five of the second decade of centuries of our era may thus be described as an immense attempt at securing mutual aid and support on a grand scale, by means of the principles of federation and association carried on through all manifestations of human life and to all possible degrees. This attempt was attended with success to a very great extent. It united men formerly divided, it secured them a very great deal of freedom, and it tenfolded their forces. At a time when particularism was bred by so many agencies, and the causes of discord and jealousy might have been so numerous, it is gratifying to see that cities scattered over a wide continent had so much in common, and were so ready to confederate for the prosecution of so many common aims. They succumbed in the long run before powerful enemies, not having understood the mutual aid principle widely enough, they themselves committed fatal faults, but they did not perish through their own jealousies, and their errors were not a want of federation spirit among themselves. The result of that new move which mankind made in the medieval city were immense. 
At the beginning of the 11th century, the towns of Europe were small clusters of miserable huts, adorned but with low, clumsy churches, the builders of which hardly knew how to make an ark. The arts mostly consisting of some weaving and forging were in their infancy. Learning was found in but a few monasteries. 350 years later, the very face of Europe had been changed. The land was dotted with rich cities, surrounded by immense thick walls which were embellished by towers and gates, each of them a work of art in itself. The cathedrals, conceived in a grand style and profusely decorated, lifted their bell towers to the skies, displaying a purity of form and a boldness of imagination, which you now vainly strive to attain. The crafts and arts had risen to a degree of perfection, which we can hardly boast of having superseded in many directions. If the inventive skill of the worker and the superior finish of his work be appreciated higher than rapidity of fabrication, the navies of the free cities furrowed in all directions, the northern and the southern Mediterranean, one effort more and they would cross the oceans. Over large tracts of land, well-being had taken the place of misery, learning had grown and spread. The methods of science had been elaborated, the basis of natural philosophy had been laid down, and the way had been paved for all the mechanical inventions of which our own times are so proud. Such were the magic changes accomplished in Europe in less than 400 years. And the losses which Europe sustained through the loss of its free cities can only be understood when we compare the 17th century with the 14th or the 13th. The prosperity which formerly characterized Scotland, Germany, the plains of Italy, was gone. The roads had fallen into an abject state. The cities were depopulated. Labor was brought into slavery. Art had vanished. Commerce itself was decaying. If the medieval cities had bequeathed to us no written documents to testify of their splendor, and left nothing behind but the monuments of building art, which we see now all over Europe, from Scotland to Italy, and from Girona in Spain to Breslau in Slavonian territory, we might yet conclude that the times of independent city life were times of the greatest development of human intellect during the Christian era down to the end of the 18th century. On looking, for instance, at a medieval picture representing Nuremberg, with its scores of towers and lofty spires, each of which bore the stamp of free creative art, we can hardly conceive that 300 years before the town was built a collection of miserable hovels. And our admiration grows when we go into the details of the architecture and decorations of each of the countless churches, bell towers, gates and communal houses, which are scattered all over Europe, as far east as Bohemia, and the now dead towns of Polish Galicia. Not only Italy, that mother of art, but all Europe is full of such monuments. The very fact that of all arts, architecture, a social art above all, had attained the highest development is significant in itself. To be what it was, it must have originated from an eminently social life. Medieval architecture attained its grandeur not only because it was a natural development of handicraft, not only because each building, each architectural decoration had been devised by men who knew through the experience of their own hands what artistic effects can be obtained from stone, iron, bronze or even from simple logs and mortar, not only because each monument was a result of collective experience accumulated in each mystery or craft, it was grand because it was born out of a grand idea. Like Greek art, it sprang out of a conception of brotherhood and unity fostered by the city. It had an audacity which could only be won by audacious struggles and victories. It had that expression of vigor, because vigor permeated all the life of the city. A cathedral or a communal house symbolized the grandeur of an organism, of which every mason and stonecutter was the builder, and a medieval building appears not as a solitary effort to which thousands of slaves would have contributed the share assigned them by one man's imagination. All the city contributed to it. The lofty bell tower rose upon a structure, grand in itself, in which the life of the city was throbbing, not upon a meaningless scaffold like the Paris Iron Tower, not as a sham structure in stone intended to conceal the ugliness of an iron frame, as has been done in the Tower Bridge. Like the Acropolis of Athens, the cathedral of a medieval city was intended to glorify the grandeur of the victorious city, 
to symbolize the union of its crafts, to express the glory of each citizen in a city of his own creation. After having achieved its craft revolution, the city often began a new cathedral in order to express the new, wider and broader union which had been called into life. The means at hand for these grand undertakings were disproportionately small. Cologne Cathedral was begun with a yearly outlay of but 500 marks. A gift of 100 marks was inscribed as a grand donation. And even when the work approached completion, and gifts poured in in proportion, the yearly outlay in money stood at about 5,000 marks and never exceeded 14,000. The Cathedral of Basel was built with equally small means. But each corporation contributed its part of stone, work and decorative genius to their common monument. Each guild expressed in its political conceptions, telling in stone or in bronze the history of the city, glorifying the principles of liberty, equality and fraternity, praising the city's allies and sending to eternal fire its enemies. And each guild bestowed its love upon the communal monument by richly decorating it with stained windows, paintings, gates worthy to be the gates of paradise, as Michelangelo said, or stone decorations of each minutest corner of the building. Small cities, even small parishes, vied with the big agglomerations in this work, and the cathedrals of Laon and saint Wen hardly stand behind that of Reims, or the communal house of Bremen, or the folkmote's bell tower of Breslau. No work must be begun by the commune, but such as are conceived in response to the grand heart of the commune, composed of the hearts of all citizens, united in one common will. Such were the words of the Council of Florence. And this spirit appears in all communal works of common utility, such as the canals, terraces, vineyards, and fruit gardens around Florence, or the irrigation canals which intersected the plains of Lombardy, or the port and aqueduct of Genoa, or in fact any works of the kind which were achieved by almost every city. All arts had progressed in the same way in the medieval cities, those of our own days mostly being but a continuation of what had grown at that time. The prosperity of the Flemish cities was based upon the fine woolen cloth they fabricated. Florence, at the beginning of the 14th century, before the Black Death, fabricated from 70,000 to 100,000 panni of woolen stuffs, which were valued at 1,200,000 golden florins. The chiseling of precious metals, the art of casting, the fine forging of iron, were creations of the medieval mysteries, which had succeeded in attaining in their own domains all that could be made by hand, without the use of a powerful prime motor. By the hand and by invention, because to use Wevel's words, Parchment and paper, printing and engraving, improved glass and steel, gunpowder, clocks, telescopes, the mariner's compass, the reformed calendar, the decimal notation, algebra, trigonometry, chemistry, counterpoint, an invention equivalent to a new creation of music. These are all possessions which we inherit from that which has so disparagingly been termed the stationary period. True that no new principle was illustrated by any of these discoveries, as Wewell said, but medieval science had done something more than the actual discovery of new principles. It had prepared the discovery of all the new principles which we know at the present time in mechanical sciences. It had accustomed the explorer to observe facts and to reason from them. It was inductive science, even though it had not yet fully grasped the importance and the powers of induction, and it laid the foundations of both mechanics and natural philosophy. Francis Bacon, Galileo, and Copernicus were the direct descendants of a Roger Bacon and a Michael Scott, as the steam engine was a direct product of the researches carried on in the Italian universities on the weight of the atmosphere, and of the mathematical and technical learning which characterized Nuremberg. But why should one take trouble to insist upon the advance of science and art in the medieval city? Is it not enough to point to the cathedrals in the domain of skill? to the Italian language and the poems of Dante in the domain of thought, to give at once the measure of what the medieval city created during the four centuries it lived. The medieval cities have undoubtedly rendered an immense service to European civilization. 
they have prevented it from being drifted into the theocracies and despotical states of old. They have endowed it with the variety, the self-reliance, the force of initiative, and the immense intellectual and material energies it now possesses, which are the best pledge for its being able to resist any new invasion of the East. But why did these centers of civilization, which attempted to answer to deeply seated needs of human nature, and were so full of life, not live further on? Why were they seized with senile debility in the 16th century? And after having repulsed so many assaults from without, and only borrowed new vigor from their interior struggles, why did they finally succumb to both? Various causes contributed to this effect, some of them having their roots in the remote past, while others originated in the mistakes committed by the cities themselves. Towards the end of the 15th century, mighty states, reconstructed on the old Roman pattern, were already coming into existence. In each country and each region, some feudal lord, more cunning, more given to hoarding, and often less scrupulous than his neighbors, had succeeded in appropriating to himself richer personal domains. More peasants on his lands, more knights in his following, more treasures in his chest. He had chosen for his seat a group of happily situated villages, not yet trained into free municipal life. Paris, Madrid, or Moscow, and with the labor of his serfs, he had made of them royal fortified cities, whereto he attracted war companions by a free distribution of villages, and merchants by the protection he offered to trade. The germ of a future state, which began gradually to absorb other similar centers, was thus laid. Lawyers versed in the study of Roman law flocked into such centers. A tenacious and ambitious race of men issued from among the burgesses, who equally hated the naughtiness of the lords and what they called the lawlessness of the peasants. The very forms of the village community, unknown to their code, the very principle of federalism, were repulsive to them as barbarian inheritances. Caesarism, supported by the fiction of popular consent and by the force of arms, was their ideal, and they worked hard for those who promised to realize it. The Christian Church, once a rebel against Roman law, and now its allied, work in the same direction. The attempt at constituting the theocratic empire of Europe, having proved a failure, the more intelligent and ambitious bishops now yielded support to those whom they reckoned upon for reconstituting the power of the kings of Israel or of the emperors of Constantinople. The Church bestowed upon the rising rulers her sanctity, she crowned them as God's representatives on earth. She brought to their service the learning and the statesmanship of her ministers, her blessings and maledictions, her riches and the sympathies she had retained among the poor. The peasants, whom the cities had failed or refused to free, on seeing the burghers impotent to put an end to the interminable wars between the knights, which wars they had to dearly to pay for, now set their hopes upon the king, the emperor, or the great prince, and while aiding them to crush down the mighty feudal owners, they aided them to constitute the centralized state. And finally, the invasions of the Mongols and the Turks, the holy war against the Moors in Spain, as well as the terrible wars which soon broke out between the growing centers of sovereignty, Ile-de-France and Burgundy, Scotland and England, England and France, Lithuania and Poland, Moscow and Tver, and so on, contributed to the same end. Mighty states made their appearance, and the cities had now to resist not only loose federations of lords, but strongly organized centers which had armies of serfs at their disposal. The worst was that the growing autocracies found support in the divisions which had grown within the cities themselves. The fundamental idea of the medieval city was grand, but it was not wide enough. Mutual aid and support cannot be limited to a small association. They must be spread to its surroundings, or else the surroundings will absorb the association. And in this respect, the medieval citizen had committed a formidable mistake at the outset. Instead of looking upon the peasants and artisans who gathered under the protection of his walls as upon so many aids, who would contribute their part to the making of the city, as they really did, a sharp division was traced between the families of old burghers and the newcomers. For the former, all benefits from communal trade and communal lands were reserved, 
and nothing was left for the latter but the right of freely using the skill of their own hands. The city thus became divided into the burghers, or the commonalty, and the inhabitants. The trade which was formerly communal now became the privilege of the merchant and artisan families, and the next step, that of becoming individual or the privilege of oppressive trusts, was unavoidable. The same division took place between the city proper and the surrounding villages. The commune had well tried to free the peasants, but her wars against the lords became, as already mentioned, wars for freeing the city itself from the lords, rather than for freeing the peasants. She left to the lords his right over the villains, on condition that he would molest the city no more and would become co burgher But the nobles, adopted by the city, and now residing within its walls, simply carried on the old war within the very precincts of the city. They disliked to submit to a tribunal of simple artisans and merchants, and fought their old feuds in the streets. Each city had now its colonnas and orsinis, its oversolces and vices. During large incomes from the estates they had still retained, they surrounded themselves with numerous clients and feudalized the customs and habits of the city itself. And when discontent began to be felt in the artisan classes of the town, they offered their sword and their followers to settle the differences by a free fight, instead of letting the discontent find out the channels which it did not fail to secure itself in olden times. The greatest and the most fatal error of most cities was to base their wealth upon commerce and industry, to the neglect of agriculture. They thus repeated the error, which had once been committed by the cities of antique Greece, and they fell through it into the same crimes. The estrangement of so many cities from the land necessary drew them into a policy hostile to the land, which became more and more evident in the times of Edward III, the French Jacqueries, the Hussite Wars, and the Peasant War in Germany. On the other hand, a commercial policy involved them in distant enterprises. Colonies were founded by the Italians in the southeast, by German cities in the east, by Slavonian cities in the far northeast. Mercenary armies began to be kept for colonial wars, and soon for local defense as well. Loans were contacted to such an extent as to totally demoralize the citizens. An internal contest grew worse and worse at each election, during which the colonial politics in the interest of a few families was at stake. The division into a rich and poor grew deeper, and in the 16th century, in each city, the royal authority found ready allies and support among the poor. And there is yet another cause of the decay of communal institutions, which stands higher and lies deeper than all the above. The history of the medieval cities offers one of the most striking illustrations of the power of ideas and principles upon the destinies of mankind, and of the quite opposed results which are obtained when a deep modification of leading ideas has taken place. Self-reliance and federalism, the sovereignty of each group, and the construction of the political body from the simple to the composite were the leading ideas in the 11th century. But since that time, the conceptions had entirely changed. The students of Roman law and the prelates of the church, closely bound together since the time of Innocent III, had succeeded in paralyzing the idea, the antique Greek idea, which presided at the foundation of the cities. For two or three hundred years they were taught from the pulpit, the university chair, and the judge's bench, that salvation must be sought for in a strongly centralized state, placed under a semi-divine authority, that one man can and must be the savior of society, and that in the same name of public salvation he can commit any violence, burn men and women at the stake, make them perish under indescribable tortures, plunge whole provinces into the most abject misery, nor do they fail to give object lessons to this effect on a grand scale and with an unheard of cruelty, wherever the king's sword and the church's fire or both at once could reach. By these teachings and examples continually repeated and enforced upon public attention, the very minds of the citizens had been shaped into a new mold. They began to find no authority too extensive, no killing by degrees too cruel, once it was for public safety, and with this new direction of mind and this new belief in one man's power, 
the old Federalist principle faded away, and the very creative genius of the masses died out. The Roman idea was victorious, and in such circumstances, the centralized state had in the cities a ready prey. Florence in the 15th century is typical for this change. Formerly, a popular revolution was the signal of a new departure. Now, when the people brought to despair and surged, it had constructive ideas no more. No fresh idea came out of the movement. A thousand representatives were put into the communal council instead of 400. Hundred men entered the signoria instead of 80. But a revolution of figures could be of no avail. The people's discontent was growing up and new revolts followed. A savior, the Tyran, was appealed to. He massacred the rebels, but the disintegration of the communal body continued worse than ever. And when after a new revolt, the people of Florence appealed to their most popular man, Geronimo Savonarola, for advice, the monk's answer was, O oh, people mine, thou knowest that I cannot go into state affairs. Purify thy soul, and if in such a disposition of mine thou reformest thy city, then, people of Florence, thou shalt have inaugurated the reform in all Italy. Carnival masks and vicious books were burned. A law of charity and another against usurers were passed, and the democracy of Florence remained where it was. The old spirit had gone. By too much trusting to government, they had ceased to trust to themselves. They were unable to open new issues. The state had only to step in and to crush down their last liberties. And yet... The current of mutual aid and support did not die out in the masses. It continued to flow even after that defeat. It rose up again with a formidable force in answer to the communist appeals of the first propagandist of the reform. And it continued to exist even after the masses, having failed to realize the life which they hoped to inaugurate under the inspiration of a reformed religion, fell under the dominations of an autocratic power. It flows still even now, and it seeks its way to find out a new expression, which could n would not be the state, nor the medieval city, nor the village community of the barbarians, nor the savage clan, but would proceed from all of them, and yet be superior to them in its wider and more deeply humane conceptions. This has been a production of Audible Anarchist. You can find more Audible Anarchist on YouTube.